We are going to uh, jump right in. So if you want to go to the Psalms, and if you wouldn't mind going to Psalm 126 in your Bible, if you didn't bring one today, there's one right in front of you somewhere. Uh, as Brad mentioned, we're in the Songs of Ascent. The one we're going to look at today is Psalm 126. Are you ready? Um, I asked myself that question about 20 minutes ago. And uh, if I'm honest, just about every day, especially on Sundays where I might share, I really do wonder if I'm ready. And uh, I can simultaneously tell you I know I'm, I'm not. And especially today, I don't feel really ready. Um, but I, I also felt God breathe encouragement to me that I'd want to give to you, which is that I'm always ready. And we're always ready. And in 2 Peter, it says, we've been given everything we need for life and godliness. And so um, I just pray that God would encourage you today. This, that's what this song is about. Uh, it's about a people that in a place where they felt farthest from ready, God wanted to breathe a readiness into him. And so I hope that's what you would experience this morning. Um, Psalm 126 starts this way. It says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. So I wanted to give this some context this morning, so I'm going to quickly just go right back through it. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion is a reference to the idea that when this psalm was written, it would have been shortly after the people of Israel, the Jews, had been released by King Cyrus. They had been 70 years in captivity and slavery, and Cyrus let them go. And so the captives were, were allowed to return to their homeland. They had been ripped from their homes, forced to, into slavery. This had been, uh, I don't think we could probably really capture an idea of what this must, must have felt like or been like, but uh, 70 years of oppression in slavery, and they're set free. And it says, we were like men who dreamed. And the idea here would be is that as they were released, they were thinking, is this really happening? Is this really possible? We thought this would never happen to us. It's almost like if this was just a dream. This, it came with such quickness, such power, such amazement. It was fulfilled prophecy. It blew their minds. Uh, some of your translations might even say, uh, like men who were restored to health, it was almost as if they had been brought from death to life or the most hopeless physical situation to, to health. And so they're saying, we're like men who are out of our mind. Like dreaming. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And so I don't know if you've ever had a how in the world did this happen type of moment like this. I'm going to refer to a couple of mine here shortly, but where all you could do is laugh, uh, where all you could do is speak in joyous unbelief, where all you and others could talk about is how miraculous what God did truly was. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And that's in quotes because there's a reference here to the idea that all of a sudden, totally non-believing nations, people who did not recognize the God of Israel, were saying, the Lord, your Lord, your God did something great. And so again, we would probably most often read right through this and, and blow right by it, but there's a profound 
unbelievable recognition from surrounding nations, from people that did not know or recognize God, saying this, this is only the hand of God. Could have allowed something like this to happen. And then an, an immediate recognition of that by the author, yes, it is the Lord that's done these great things. And we're filled with joy. And then, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. And the Negev, I learned this week, is an area far south of Palestine, usually very desert-like. And at rare and random occasions, in different seasons, rain would leave standing pools of water and rivers of flowing water for the people to enjoy. And they would immediately associate that with the blessing of God. But really what I wanted to talk about this morning is this idea of restore our fortunes. Because they're on the heels of just being set free. They've just been released from 70 years of slavery. And so as I studied that this week, I found out two things. One was that some of the people of Israel remained. They were still in captivity. They hadn't returned to their homeland yet. And so this song was a prayer and an encouragement for those people, the ones that remained, while some were set free and were experiencing a salvation from captivity. Others were still, still in captivity. Perhaps more importantly, or just as importantly, uh, was this concept that I found when it, as it referred to restoring fortunes. Those that had come out of captivity Some of those that had been released and were allowed to go home were still in distress, even in their homeland. So even though they've been released from 70 years and they never thought it would happen or if it was going to, it wasn't going to happen in their lifetime and they've been granted salvation and freedom, and yet some remain in distress. Uh, Here's some commentary I found this week, Matthew Henry. Let those that have returned to their homeland, their own land, be eased of burdens which they are yet groaning under. And I'd ask you just to think about some of the spiritual parallel here. So that this might speak to someone who has received salvation and, and new life in Jesus Christ and yet still groans, still carries heavy, heavy burden. Let those that remain in Babylon, not yet saved, have their hearts stirred up as ours were to take benefit of the liberty that was granted. And I love this statement. The beginnings of mercy are encouragements to us to pray for the completion of it. As if God was just getting something started. And then I underline this one. While we are here in this world, there will still be matter for prayer. Even when we are most furnished with matter for praise. And so I just want to acknowledge that this morning. We're talking about the songs of ascent. We're talking about praising, worshiping, reveling in awe of our God. And and that is more than do him. And yet at the same time, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that there remains matter in our lives for prayer. And when we are free and in prosperity ourselves, we must not be unmindful that we have brethren that are in trouble and under restraint. The bringing of those that were yet in captivity to join with their brethren that that had returned would be as welcome to both sides as streams of water in those countries which were parched and dry. And so today, that's what I want to talk about and that's who I want to talk to. And it would be In the verse we looked at, those who sow in tears that they may reap with songs of joy, that he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, sow, would return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. And if I had to put it into two words, I would say don't quit. I'm going to say that a lot today. Don't quit. So a quick question I had, and I was grateful it's answered in my Bible, is why would anyone weep while they're planting seed? So if you don't know what sowing seed is, it is the idea of going out with literal handfuls of seeds and sowing them into the ground. With the idea that with water they would 
sprout and grow and create a crop. And so I asked the question, why would anybody weep while doing that? And then I actually asked as well, why would anybody who is in a hopeless state of mourning be going out to sow seed? So here are some thoughts behind that. During times of drought, sowing seed, so to sow seed in drought, you know it's not going to rain. Why would you sow seed? This would be accompanied by anxiety. Were the people doing this just wasting their seed? Or would rains come and bring a harvest? This psalm, this song, reminds the people that in the bleakest of days, such as those in physical captivity, they could turn to joy. It also encouraged those still living in, with tears and fears to anticipate God's future joy. So I want to talk just briefly about what sowing was and is biblically, uh, even physically, just, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, again, the idea of planting or laying seeds. It's a law of the natural world. It starts in the Bible in Genesis 1, the idea of laying seed that leads to food. It's a, it's, a, it's a law of a spiritual world as well regarding God's blessing. So there are several places in Scripture where you can read about sowing and reaping spiritually. It implies a time of waiting. Uh, in Galatians 6, we find that we reap in kind to what we sow. So if you reap an apple seed, you'll reap an apple. Galatians 6 says, if you reap... Uh, According to the flesh, you'll reap destruction. If you reap according to the Spirit, you'll sow, or if you sow according to the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. We also are told that we reap in proportion to what we sow. So 2 Corinthians says if we sow generously, we will reap generously. If we sow sparingly, we will reap sparingly. We also find in Scripture that we reap more than what we sow. So we see that even in this scripture, the idea that uh, sowing in tears, we would reap in in sheaves, literal bundles of joy. Verse I wanted to share with you from John 12, 24 through 25 says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies or in its death, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life, this was Jesus speaking, will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The idea behind this, and we'll, we'll reference this a couple times, but would be that we're, we're a seed that must die in order for greater life to come. And that's a, a, a spiritual thing but for Jesus himself it was also a a literal physical thing at the same time he died he gave his life as a seed as a kernel for us in order that life could be abundant for us so I want to make a major transition here and this is where I don't know if I'm ready Um, I want to ask if you ever felt like your life was just crumbling just falling apart. I don't even care what age you are. I don't want to trivialize it. Where you just really felt that. Like a dream or a hope or a desire that was so important to you was dying. That you can remember distinctly just wanting to quit. Just wanted to be done. You wanted to quit trying. You wanted to quit praying. You wanted to quit caring. You just felt like you're at the end. And as I read this verse this week, God reminded me that for me to inherit true and deep eternal life, going through that, might have been the only way. Having that dream or that desire or that thing in my life being lost or dying might have been the only way for me to have an abundant 
life. And so I just want you to think about that. I, I, I don't want to project that onto you. Uh, I wanted to personalize this because it's one thing to talk about sowing in tears and, and then reaping joy and, and saying, you know what, we all do that. But this is where I really felt challenged this week to just share part of my story with you guys in hopes that it would be an encouragement and in hopes that it would make it a, l- a little more real to you. And so interestingly enough, I was reading Psalm 126 this week and, and then I read right into Psalm 127. And I'd read this Psalm before and this is actually verses three through five. I think Brad's gonna talk a little bit more about Psalm 127, one and two next week. But this is, this is, a, this is a verse that I've read before, but in a particular point in my life is, is when I read it is what I wanna share to you. It says this, sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man, that's continuing, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they, when they contend with their enemies in the gate. So I'm going to put the first part of it back up there. There's a point in my life where I read this, and my wife and I had uh, been struggling with infertility for I, I don't know how many years, honestly. And I read this, and I just got angry. And I thought, if sons are a heritage from the Lord and children are a reward for him, and I don't have any, and I want them so bad. I've asked so many times. I've sowed tears. Maybe I'm not worthy of a reward. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I sin too much. Maybe I don't get you, God. Maybe I don't really love you. Like arrows in the hands of the warrior are sons born in one's youth. So am I not a warrior? Am I, am I missing it? What am I doing wrong, God? Why isn't it enough? What do I need to change? Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So I guess I'm not blessed. Because I want a quiver. And I got nothing but empty arms. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Why do I feel shame? All the time. Why do I feel shameful? When I read this verse, why do I feel like my enemies continue to beat me? Couple that with another place I was, and just to set you all at ease, um, I talked about this with my wife this week. I asked her for, for her permission. And so this, this is our story. As you know, it takes two uh, to have a marriage and two to have children. And, and so the, this infertility story is our story. But it was paralleled with something that was also our story, but it was her story first. And I read this week that uh, one out of four women before the age of 18 is sexually abused. One out of four I mean, we, we think about even being in this building. One out of four? One out of ten couples struggles with infertility at some point. But one out of four women before age 18 sexually abused. And that happened to my wife. And we went into our marriage thinking and hoping and praying that I had been redeemed and forgiven And quite frankly, we did not expect it to wreak havoc on our marriage, on our relationship. And I I could, and it it wouldn't be worth it. And this isn't a sob story. This isn't, uh, I mean, we talked about it this week. We've, We've so often not shared this story. We've never wanted it to be about us. But we also have come to believe over the years that this is, this is something that God wants us to share at the right time in the right way. 
because if there's one out of four women that have been abused, then there's one out of four husbands that know what I know. And and it was a day where I was reading a book called The Haunted Marriage, written by two Christian doctors who had both had wives who had been abused. And I just remember closing the book and thinking, God, how in the world did this happen? To my wife? To me? What did, what did I do wrong? This isn't what I asked for. This isn't what I deserve. So not only were we infertile, but if we were ever to be healthy enough to even be intimate, it wasn't going to work anyway. So I wanted to quit. I really did. And I didn't know if my marriage would make it. And so I didn't know it. But God's spirit inside me allowed me to sow tears. And, and I, I didn't realize it. I didn't remember it. But I, uh, I told you I was reading through Psalm 126 and I ran into Psalm 127 and then I, I noticed that I had written a note on December 5th of 2008. This was a sowing in tears moment. This is a prayer I wrote. Gracious Dad, today my prayer is that you would bless us with the quiver of your children. Father, it is the desire of our hearts to be parents. Yet, Lord, we submit, surrender, and defer to your will. We ask according to your will, God, please let it be. We understand the depth of a reward this would be, and that we are both undeserving and unready. Lord, regardless of your timing and your will, I commit to repenting and living the life of a warrior which you have set before me. Whether you arm me with arrows of children or not. My and our freedom and destiny is not determined by children, precious king, but rather by your majesty, your glory, and your plan. Thank you for loving Michael, that's my wife's name, and I, for the marvelous inheritance you have already given us. Sowing. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you. I I don't even remember writing it. This is desperation. This is cluelessness. This is not knowing and not understanding. Uh, Another commentary from Henry. It says, Suffering saints have a seedness of tears. They are in tears often. They share in calamities of human life and commonly have a greater share in them than others. But they sow in tears. They do the duty of an afflicted state, and so answer the intentions of the providences they are under. Weeping must not hinder sowing. When we suffer ill, we must be doing well. Nay, as the ground is by the rain prepared for the seed, and the farmer sometimes chooses to sow in the wet, so we must improve times of affliction in disposing us to repentance and prayer and humiliation. Nay, there are tears which are themselves the seed that we must sow. Tears of tenderness in prayer and under the word. These are precious seed, such as the farmer sows when the corn is so dear and he has but little for his family and he therefore weeps to part with it, yet buries it under the ground anyway, expecting to receive it again with advantage. Thus does a good man a good woman, so in tears. And so Friday, I was driving back with my wife from Ikea. She wanted to go there for her birthday, and we just did. We said, what, is it, what does it look like to sew? 
And what doesn't it look like to sow? And so here's just some suggestions from, from our experience. Maybe it's different from you. We believe sowing looks like expecting, trusting. And again, I'm, I'm, just, I'm envisioning a guy going out and dropping seed to grow crops, knowing that it might not rain for years. But he's, he's sowing. Anyway, expecting, trusting, taking risks, knowing God is planning something, not quitting, still doing all the good and right and obedient things, even in our suffering. This is sowing in tears. Here's what sowing is not. Giving up is not sowing. Sitting still, being passive, wallowing in bitterness and anger, waiting and whining, complaint, despair, Insisting on a break instead of walking and stepping. And we know it, sometimes just breathing and aching, but doing so, resting in faith. I got to uh, sit in a coffee shop with a good friend this week, and uh, he wanted to talk about James 1, 2 through 8. And so it was too uh, (laughs) synchronized. So I want to read this as well. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face many trials. And every time I read it, I'm like, are you serious? Like, this is almost comical. Consider it pure joy. Yeah, I still got a lot of work to do there. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It's the only way you're going to be able to find any joy is if you understand this, that perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we're never going to get it. God gets it, and he knows what we need more than we do. More than we do. And he doesn't want us to be incomplete. He doesn't want us to, to live and in, in, in stay in, in sorrow and in, in sowing tears. He wants to bring an abundance, sheaves of joy. And he will, if we let him, and if if we can put our eyes off of the things that we think are the most mature, complete things we need and put them on him and the things that he has already given us and wants to continue giving us. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And so uh, wherever you're at, it's just a, a, a mild poke, a nudge. If you need, are you asking him for what you need? Once or twice, a long time ago, are you, are you, are you, at, are you begging, are you asking? And this one stings a little bit more, but it's there. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man or woman should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable, and all he does, ouch. But God reminded me, as I was studying this this week, that many times in my life, I would be found praying and asking, but not believing. And I needed to pause from the asking and even the demanding. And I just needed to get stable. On, back on stable ground. Back genuinely believing and trusting and knowing Jesus Christ. And then, that didn't just transform me, it also transformed my prayers. And then he begins to answer. And so I know it stings, but that we must heed. Uh, This was in a commentary as well. God sent, and this was in commentary in regards to the Babylonian captivity, but it's, it's our spiritual captivity. God sent them into captivity, not as dross is put into a fire to be consumed. That's not his intent. I'm putting you through this just to burn you up, but rather as gold to be refined. And that made me think of James 1.28. Just one more. 
Matthew 7, 9 through 11 says this, which of you, if the son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And I had to add this last part too. It says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So just two things I want to hit here. And I, I feel like I already said it, but one, God knows what you need more than you do. And he hears you asking. He hears you sowing. And he's not going to give you a snake or a stone. He's taking you to a maturity and a completeness that is so much better than what you're even asking for. And believe it or not, on top of that, he wants to throw in even, even more. Secondly, in everything, doing to others what you would have them doing to you is never forgetting that other people are suffering and they're hurting. And we're so quick to overlook or dismiss other people's aches and pains. And God just reminded me this week, I know what I needed. I know what people in this room were to me when Michael and I were at our lowest low. And that's what I want to be back to the church. So, along with centuries of Jews, this is my song. This is my song. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. I knew this would be the hardest part. My boys are growing up really fast. God's given me three of them. What a quiver. One of my favorite things in the world is just to hold all three of them at the same time. They're getting too big. I'm not going to be able to do it for very long. But I did it this week. And God just said, do you see the sheaves? Bundles. Your arms were empty. I filled them. And so I don't know where you're at. You may feel so empty. You may feel full. I want you to hear today that if you feel empty, don't quit. Because I will thank God forever for what he's done for me. And I believe with all my heart that if he did it for me, he wants to do it for you. I don't know what that looks like, but I believe it. I believe if you sow faithfully in your tears that he is good to his word and sheaves are headed your way. God brought my wife and I healing from abuse. We're still healing. That won't stop, but we've been brought healing. He brought us children. We asked for wisdom and for help, and we got it. And I had a phone call with a friend last night, and he was at the end of his rope. And I said, buddy, we're, we're on the right path because you're finally asking for help. And some of you just need to say, I need help. There's people here that want to help. We prayed our guts out. We knew that the best gifts would be. We knew that the best gifts would be and how to mature us at the same time. And so here's what happened. We got matured by sowing. And we got children and healing. We've laughed and we've said to ourselves, are we dreaming? This is crazy. We are amazed at what God has done and so are others. People tell us all the time, God did that for you. Believing people and non-believing people can't help but say, God did that for you. Last thing I want to say, um, whatever you're going through, this should be our 
salvation song. Um, we looked at John 14. Jesus Christ was the kernel that died, that lost its life, that might, re- that might in turn produce many seeds, which would be us. And those seeds, however, would also be called to die. And so part of our journey is, is a death to the things we don't need and don't need to be. And it's not comfortable. And so I'll close with this thought. Uh, I listened to this sermon again. It's one of my favorites. Um, as, as this guy preaches on Luke 14, 25 through 35, if you want to reference it or look at it. He talks about the cost of being a disciple and he says multiple times, don't quit. And so again, I would just say to you today, don't quit. His words, Jesus never said life would be easy. He doesn't fix everything. He just makes an inevitable death meaningful and purposeful. Jesus makes suffering, pain, hardship, and sacrifice all purposeful. So don't quit. Accomplish and complete things that are worthwhile. Live in ways that are worthwhile. Read your Bible and pray. Repent and fight for a zeal and spirit-filled devotion. Give, help, and serve others. Jesus never quit. He accepted the opposition, the death, the confusion, the pain, the loss, the sacrifice, and he never quit. He sowed in tears, and he came back to life with abundant sheaves for us all. Let's pray. God, um, we uh, just thank you, Lord. I am humbled to even uh, pretend, God, to understand what people in this room uh, endure. I know some of the stories, God. And I know some that are sowing in tears that are so much greater uh, than anything I've known. And it humbles me, God, to even get up here and pretend to relate. It scares me that I might offend. But God, I just know what you've done in me. I know what your word says. I've seen you work miracles in my life and in others. And so God, I just want to sow in tears with those that are are aching and weeping. But God, I don't want people to quit and I don't want people to lose hope and I don't want people to lose sight, God, of who you are and what you've done for us and the abundance that you have already paid a price for, but God, that you also want to continue to give. So I I do, God, I just beg you that for those that hurt the most today, that they would feel loved, and God, that they would be given hope. That's my prayer. Lord, I love you, and I thank you for giving us sheaves. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.